Lori Houston's News for the Heart is dedicated to helping you give a voice to your own soul. Our hearts have the power to free us from pain and the struggles that keep us from awakening to our true essence. Join Lori now as we delve into our heart and soul to find the path that will open us to the possibilities and lead us to the life we love to live. And good afternoon. This is News for the Heart. And today, well, it's the last Tuesday of the month, which means I have my awesome co-host with with me, Tom Campbell. Now, Tom, you just returned from a wonderful celebration, which I really wish I had been able to come to, but did not pan out. But let's chat about that a little bit. Welcome to the show. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, it was really a very, um, uh, a very wonderful um, uh, event. It worked out very well, and you know, I was. Well, I'm skeptical of everything, but you know, it was, it was something we hadn't done before. Right. It was, this was Keith's idea. And um, it really wasn't the usual event where Tom talks all day and the audience listens and asks questions. You know, it's, it wasn't a, a mainly a and a I did some Q and a for two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon, but that was it. Okay. The idea was, is that the people there were to interact, were to, uh, you know, get to know each other, were to, you know, talk. And we gave them a task at the beginning that said to try to come, because these are, these were people who have been to multiple events. These are, you know, there were a couple of people there that this was their first time, but the large majority of these people have been around MBT for at least five, some of them 10, 15 years, you know, they've been doing MBT. So this was the hardcore MBT group for the most part. And I asked them to uh, be thinking about ways that, that we could uh, spread the ideas that love is the answer, that we need to be, you know, more kind and caring, and we need to be that way, not just act that way, and so on. You know, how can we, we uh, spread this, this uh, philosophy or, or, you know, whatever you might call it, uh, you know, to more and more people? How do we reach? So they thought about that, and they came up at the end. You know, they did, you know, we had like seven or eight people get up out of the audience and did little presentations about things they thought could be done. And so it was all was very good. But this was a party. It was like a house party for old MBT crowd. And we did it in Europe, of course. This was in, in uh, England. It was called Beamish Hall, which was a big... I don't know if you'd call it a castle, big manor house, you know, very much like Lumley. You were at Lumley. Well, it was a big place like Lumley, you know, and it um, it uh, was full. Plus, we had overflow into a couple of other facilities, and they were full. Whoa. So we had so we had about eighty people. Nice. We had about eighty people there. When you were at Lumley, it was about the same. It was about ninety people, but it was very similar to uh, to the size of the crowd at, at Lumley, yes. and you know, they played games. They they uh, went. They danced at night. At night, there was a there was a big uh, room, and somebody got their cell phone out and dialed up their their Amazon Music and played it to the speaker system that was in the room. And so there was uh, and the hotel, you know, opened a bar because some people like that to lubricate themselves before they go dancing. You know, but in any case. So there was, there was that going on every evening. It was, you know, dancing, music. Uh, it just was a big party. And for the most part, the people that, that uh, I heard talking about it and that came up and said something to me, it was just fantastic. Everybody loved it. Yeah. And I'm, I was thinking when I went there, I said, uh-oh, what's going to happen if we get there and it's like everybody's sitting there wondering what's going to happen next and nothing really was planned. You know, Keith didn't have every minute of it planned. It was just going to spontaneously turn into something wonderful. And, and uh, I wasn't quite so sure how that would work, but uh, Keith was right. It did take place and it did spontaneously turn into something wonderful. And all the people there said it was the best event ever. And they really did, did like it. So it turned out very, very well. And I started talking, I think, maybe Wednesday or Thursday. So it was for three or four days this this went on. So it was that's how long it, it took. I, I think it 
I say three or four because it was like three plus half of another a uh, half of another day. Okay. Nice. So well, it was some, it was good. I got some personal pictures from and I apologize if I say your name wrong, T D Nordig. Yeah. She sent a bunch of pictures. I love them. But she sent a picture of you and Pamela and a dog. And I'm like, oh my goodness. You guys actually took one of your dogs and said, no, no, someone brought one, but it, but it looked just like one of yours. And it was just such a great picture. I'm like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pamela um, met and petted every dog she saw <laughs> because she was having, you know, dog withdrawals since uh, yes. her five were at home and she was not with them. So we'd be out walking on the sidewalk and she'd see a dog and she'd run over. May I pet your dog? You know, may I hold your dog? And so she was uh, very much uh, trying to uh, get some doggy time in without her dogs. So yeah, there was, there were dogs everywhere we went. Europe's pretty dog friendly. So they let dogs go to restaurants and that sort of thing. And the dogs generally are well behaved and you know, dogs are welcome mostly in stores. There's a few places where they're not welcome, but most of the time they're welcome. Nice. And there's lots of dogs around. People um, bring their dogs with them when they shop and so on. So it's a little different. So Pamela did get some dog time in mm -hmm. while she was there, but yeah, there's lots of pictures. So mm -hmm. I hadn't I hadn't uh, been out on a dance floor for probably a decade <laughs> just because all the connections I had to that sort of thing disappeared. You know, when I stopped working at a company, then there was no longer the, the Christmas dance or, you know, the other kind of events that get put on and, uh, and so on. So, it, and I had a friend there that I uh, worked with for a while that uh, he and his wife liked to dance. So we'd go dancing every once in a while, but that's about a decade ago. Since Pamela and I have both been retired, we're both disconnected from yeah. that sort of social scene. And most of the places where they play dance music are also full of smoke and are just generally unpleasant places, you know, to be in. And the music's only half good. You know, Pamela and I still like the, you know, kind of the 70s, you know, rock mm -hmm. music, good dance music. <laughs> and uh, so I hadn't been out on the dance floor for a long time. So that was fun. So I had a good time and it was very easy for me just, just, talking two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon was, was uh, very little effort to uh, do that. So I wasn't as exhausted as usual if I spend, you know, six or eight hours standing up mm -hmm. in front of people and do that for three days in a row. That takes, uh, that mm -hmm. takes a lot out of you. By the end of that, you're exhausted. But by the end of this, I, I was not uh, exhausted as, as I usually, as I usually get. Mm -hmm. So, but you're baiting yourself about the whole smoky bar thing because that, well, it hasn't happened here in a really long time. So I'm assuming it hasn't happened in the States. Yeah. Well, there is still the dry ice, which can be smoky <laughs> and definitely <laughs> sick. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I do that uh, anymore. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they're not so smoky anymore, but it's been a long, it's been a long time. Like I said, at least 10 years since I've been on a dance floor. Yeah. The smoke's probably cleared a lot in 10 years. Yeah, that's that's, pro true. that's probably true. Yeah. But they're always very crowded. Uh, yeah. You know, they're always very crowded. They're shoulder to shoulder people. And of course, during the COVID thing, you know, that was all gone. Yeah. They they didn't exist because you couldn't get that crowded uh, legally with people. And, yeah, all uh, of the bars were closed. Yeah. Didn't and, do any dancing, actually. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, the dancing, I guess, was over for that time because dancing is one of those things that you just don't do six feet apart. Well, so, um, they wouldn't, well, here, dancing was banned. There was no, you were not allowed. Because mm -hmm. you, you know, you sweat <laughs> when you dance. So yeah. it was part of the, I think, anyway. But yeah. All right. Well, that sounds awesome. So it was fun. It was very good. I think, uh, yeah, everybody there thought it was superb. They did have a lot of fun with each other. And Keith had some interesting things for them to do. He, uh, of course. <laughs> you know, Keith is a very entertaining guy just all by himself. And, and you know, if you just yeah. sit and listen to Keith, you're entertained. You don't really need to do anything else. But uh, he had everybody doing things that were very entertaining. So, um, you know, even even the uh, the people who were generally very uh, 
to themselves and, and introverted and so on, even they got up and, and got involved and got interested. So everybody had a great time. Awesome. It was, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And we're going to do something similar again in Huntsville and nice. um, I don't know, maybe this fall or hmm. maybe this year or not, at least maybe next year, but sometime soon, Keith is already gotten a venue you know there's a playhouse oh. <laughs> we have we have several play companies here maybe three or four or five different play companies and there's a um what's called the von braun civic center and one of those is a you know they have big theaters and middle-sized theaters and small theaters for plays and and all sorts of things so um they have a what they call a little theater which just seats like 300 people <laughs> there's all that it seats so it's small, it's kind of intimate. And uh, um, so he's rented that whole theater. Cool. And um, evidently it, it wasn't as expensive as, as he thought. So we'll see how all that works out. You know, it's still just in the advanced planning stages, but there's going to be one here in the States, sort of like what we did in, uh, uh, in England. Nice. Nice. Maybe I can come to that one. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can come to that one. It won't be so far away. It, uh, you know, for for that matter, to get to Huntsville from where you are is probably a, a a pretty long two day drive, or probably a, a four hour? three or four. Yeah, you know, probably a four hour flight. Yeah. Yeah, probably a four hour flight. Not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah, it's not like the nine hour flight you have, you know, going to, going to Europe and yeah. and back. Yeah. Yeah. But we we did something different this time that we've never done before. We've always gone uh, cattle class, you know, that's where you're shoulder to shoulder with, you know, five seats across kind of a thing. We've always done that because we can't afford to, you know, go first class. So we go cattle class. And when you're doing this, nine hours in a row that gets really really difficult and pamela can't take that anymore and um her legs swell feet swell then by the time you get off she can't put her shoes back on because her feet have gone up a couple of sizes and it's just not healthy for her to do, you know to do that sort of thing to, to be in that kind of position where you can't move around for that long a time and um uh, so this time we sprung for the first class, nice. which was very expensive, but you know, that we were going to make some money on the event. So we figured that would be worth it. So it, um, it kind of paid for itself. So we went first class and that makes all the difference in the world. <laughs> yeah. All the difference in the world. You can actually lie down, you know, the first class seats for international, not necessarily for within the nation, but international flights, those long flights, the seats go all the way flat like a bed. And the service in first class is phenomenal. And the food is actually pretty good. <laughs> and and you can lie down and sleep. And so by the time we got there, it's not like you've been up for, you know, 30 hours. You know, it's like, usually you get there, you've been up and miserable for the last, you know, 10 hours. Because even though you're like this in an airplane for nine hours, you were sort of like that, but not quite as packed in in the airport for two or three hours before you even got in the airplane. So anyhow, it made it a, a lot nicer to go <laughs> first class. I don't know what it cost. I didn't ask. Yeah, so, <laughs> best not to find out. No. But uh, Pamela said that if she was going to go, it had to be that way or no way because her, her body just couldn't make the trip otherwise. And if she doesn't go, I don't go. So you know, that was that was it. And so we had to go first class. So it, it was a lot nicer if you have to do international travel. And if you can't afford it, first class is great. Basically, we can't afford it, except when we're doing an event that's actually going to pay for it, you know, then we can afford it. So it was nice. So the whole trip worked out very well. Nice. Yeah, no suffering was done on at either end. Perfect. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah. All right. Well, I thought we would talk about and I know we've talked about it a bit. Well, we talk about love all the time, but um, I thought we'd talk about 
specifically how love is an action. It's not something it's, it's, you give it, it's an action. It's mm -hmm. something that you share. It's the kindness. It's everything, but it's, it, love is an action. It's not, it's not a taking. <laughs> it's yeah. a giving. It's a giving. Yeah. It, and it's really an expression of who and what you are. I think that's a, you know, that's kind of an important thing. It's not something you do. It's something you are. It's, it's not that you decide, oh, I, I should love this person, or I want to love this person, or this person needs love. It's just, it's, you are sharing yourself, because that is the way you are. It's not a, it's not an action that's premeditated. It's an action that just happens. So it's a, it's a sharing of self. And it's so pretty. That's just a beautiful way of putting it because I yeah. know that. Yeah, it's a beautiful. Yeah, it's just, it's just a sharing of self. So in order to get to the point where you have a self to share, you know, first of all, of course, you have to, you know, be at ease with yourself. You have to like yourself. You have to uh, be okay with you. If you have negative attitudes towards self, then, you know, just that idea of just, you know, sharing your, your caring and your affection for just people, for everyone is difficult. And you have a capacity for that. Everybody has some capacity for just sharing themselves, just giving, just because that's what they feel like doing. And that capacity is, is uh, inversely proportional to your fear. Yeah. Inversely proportional. I, know, I shouldn't use that kind of language, should I? It's, it's the opposite of your, of your fear. So the more fear you have, then the less capacity you have for love. So if you're just a very, very fearful person, you still have a capacity for love to just give yourself because you want to, because you care, but it's a smaller fraction of yourself. If you don't have much fear, then you have a much greater capacity to love and you tend to spread that love around lots of places and lots of people. You know, it's a, it's just a general way that you interact with others. And that others is dogs and horses and cats as well as other people. You know, we're not talking just about people. We're talking and with the trees, you know, and nature. And it's, a, it's just how you connect with other, everything outside of yourself, including the environment. So, yeah, it's, it's a sharing. So, yeah, it's, it's not a thing that you do or something that's outside of you or, or whatever. It's just who you are and what you are. And the whole idea is get rid of that fear, grow your capacity to love. And if you do that, then that love will just connect all sorts of things that you'll care to and all sorts of people and all sorts of situations. You know, love is not just romantic love. That's just one sliver of it. Love is, is caring about other, caring in a, in a deep way about other people. And that's really all it is. It's, it's not a very complicated thing. And it has to be organic to you. It can't be that you act as if you care because that's acting. That's not being. It's nice civilizing, as I say. You know, everybody appreciates you acting as if you cared, but that's not what helps you grow up and it's not real. And eventually that runs out and turns into negativity. If you act your way through life, pretty soon you start feeling used, you start feeling, uh, you know, you deserve better because you've done all these nice things for people and they're not doing it for you. You see, they're the idea that you were doing it for a result, you were doing it to get something back starts to eat at you and then it turns negative after a while. So you can only act your way through life for so long. You know, and unfortunately when you know when people do this falling in love thing, which is mostly falling in need, you know, they tend to act a lot. You know, they act the way they think the other person would like them to be. Mm -hmm. And that 
is all very nice, but then once that becomes, you know, they're married or once they're, you know, living together and four or five years have gone by, you know, the acting kind of runs thin and you end up just with people who they are. And sometimes it's not nearly as pretty as it was, you know, in the first uh, in the first few days or weeks or months or even years, you know, when all that acting was going on. But you can't help that. Eventually, you have to be who you are. If you're not, you become resentful. You resent that you have to act, that you have to do these things. And you start measuring whether or not you're getting what you wanted to get for the acting that you're doing, you know, because now your acting is you going out of your way. And is that other person going out of their way for you? You see, whereas if it's really love, that's not, you don't feel like you're going out of your way. You're just expressing how you feel about people and whether, however they express it or don't express it back is irrelevant. doesn't make any difference. So that's, that's kind of the key thing about love. Love is just has to be who you are and what you are and something that you share. It's how you interact with other people. You know, so it's, it's the natural way that a low entropy being is, you know, that's the way I kind of define love is it flow. Love is the, is kind of the, a natural expression of a low entropy being that's love. And that low entropy, of course, that's another sciencey thing I probably shouldn't have said, but it, that low entropy means high quality of consciousness means no, you know, not much fear. You get rid of your fear. And when you get rid of your fear, then it's easy to like people, even people who aren't all that nice, even people who are greedy or self-centered, you still can like them. I mean, it's not that you like them being self-centered, you just realize that that's the way they are. They're struggling with their own fears, with their own you know, unhappiness and difficulties, their lessons, and they're struggling to learn. And they're doing the best they can with who they are. And then you can look at them and just like them for, the, you know, for who they are. And the fact that they are maybe prickly sometimes, well, you just work around that. You don't press their buttons. You be careful what you say. And you try to be positive. And if they go off and get negative, well, you just let it go, you know, because you don't take anything personally because it's not really about you. Because what you are is loving. And uh, so... Yeah, love is such a simple idea, you know, when you really understand it, you know, the, the what is love? And a lot of people say, well, that's hard to explain. And, you know, that's so complicated, but it isn't really all that complicated. You get rid of your fear and then you just act natural. And that's being loving. You care about people because you don't see people as what can they do for me? You know, what can I get out of this person? What's the, what's the advantage in getting to know them? You just don't see it that way. You see everybody as, as uh, somebody of value, somebody who's trying, somebody who has potential, you know, somebody who's trying to grow up. And you have compassion. Rather than judging people, you have compassion for people. So it's, uh, that's, the, that's the general concept of what it is from you know, the, the viewpoint of, of love. That's generally the way life is. So the, from the loving viewpoint, you don't look out at the world and say, oh, you know, what an awful bunch of slimy, greedy, awful people out there, you know, all the hate and all the, you know, we, we just see all the negative stuff that's going on. And, you know, people are shooting each other and particularly in the U.S., you know, we seem to have a problem with that, that mindset. You know, there's all of this, this horrendous negativity and, and, um, kind of meanness toward each other going on. But instead of letting that make you angry, that just makes you feel compassionate for those, for all the people, the victims and the perpetrators. They're all struggling. They're all confused. They don't know up from down, you know, and it, uh, you know, a very famous quote that you'll recognize immediately comes to mind. And that is when you look at these people, you say, 
forgive them. They know not what they do. You know, it's that's really the the crux of it. They don't really see themselves as as awful people. They don't see themselves as they they see themselves as justified. They see themselves as yeah, they are, you know, they're serving out justice. They're whatever, you know, that's their viewpoint that they're justified, they're right, they understand, other people don't, and they're full of, they're full of, um, what's it called? Um, well, they're full of fear, but that's not what I'm saying. They're full of um, self-righteousness. Yeah, they're just full of self-righteousness. And in their own mind, they're doing good. They are teaching people an important lesson, you know, or whatever. Or maybe they're even just getting even, you know, if they feel that they've been been wrong, but they feel justified in any case. Yes. Of course, nothing violent like that is justified at all. You know, it never justified, but in their mind, they're so twisted up. They're so mentally ill. And I use that mental illness in a very generic way. You know, most of the people walking around in our culture today are mentally ill. You know, mental illness is, is not like a thing that very few people have. It's, it's endemic. Most people have a certain degree of mental illness that they live with. And by mental illness, what I'm really saying is high entropy, you know, like low quality of consciousness. Uh, and you might say that mental ills may be also uh, spiritually ill too. You know, they, they uh, are just living only to a tiny fraction of their potential. And they're so wadded up with fear that they, uh, you know, they just get everything wadded up in their minds. They get angry. They get upset. They're very judgmental. They're quick to point their finger at other people. They, they uh, you know, are very self-centered. They act like children, really. You know, and I guess if you're six years old and you act like a child, that's okay. But when you're, you know, 66 years old and you act like a child, that's mental illness. You know, you just failed to grow up, failed to mature. So that's what I mean. So now that I'm talking mental illness in a very generic term, which means ill, dysfunctional, conscious, you know, from the, from the viewpoint, from the attitudes, from the feelings, from the anger, all that's dysfunctional. Yeah. And things that are dysfunctional, you know, I'm calling them ill. You know, if your body's dysfunctional, we call that an illness. So in this case, the the illness isn't physical, but it's emotional and spiritual. And we just take that emotional and spiritual and wad it all up into mental, you know. So, but that's that's the world we live in. And to, if that makes you angry, then that's because you're self-centered. The only reason for getting angry is you say, well, that's not the way it should be. That's not the way I want it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, the way you want it isn't really something real. You know, what you want is not necessarily the way it is. And you need to just let it be the way it is and not demand that it be right the way you want it to be. No matter which side of any of those arguments you're on, you know, everybody feels the same way that, uh, you know, they get angry because it's not the way they want it to be. They get angry at other people because those people aren't the way they want them to be. They get angry with their spouses. They get angry with their children because they're not the way they want them to be. Well, the problem isn't all those people, the spouses or the children. The problem is you demanding that people be the way you want them to be. And yes, I know the way you want them to be is what's best for them and best for everybody. But, you know, everybody on every side feels that same way. You need to let them learn and grow on their own in their own time. You can't force it. You can't push it. You can't make people grow. You can give them a safe space to grow into, which means you don't fuss with them. You know, you don't feed their fear. You don't feed their anger. Give them as much of a, of a safe space as you can, and they'll either grow or they won't. If they do, that's wonderful. If they don't, well, you know, they get to try again and again and again until eventually they get it. That's evolution. So that's the way the world is. And the world is actually a pretty neat place. 
and we have been evolving and growing and with all the nastiness out there in the world believe me it's a lot less nasty than it used to be if you can imagine it it was a lot more rough and violent and demeaning than it is now yes it's still that way a lot we're still into control power force a lot in our culture but not like it used to be we are growing and we are getting there and we're <coughs> excuse me and we are evolving so that's neat that's good and we have to do it in our own time can't hurry that up so find ways to just find your spot in it and do what you can to help and enjoy life yeah <laughs> A lot of people tend to, well, like <clears throat> they're justifying their actions, they're, you know, they think they're helping, fixing, changing, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but that's not love. That's them trying to <clears throat> the love that they think they deserve <laughs> or that that's what, you know, it's like they see in their minds what a relationship <laughs> with anybody is. Um, they have this vision or the media is created, which is worse, <laughs> this vision of what the perfect friendship is, what the perfect relationship is, what the perfect family is. And we judge everything from that, that vision that we either have or have seen or believe is somehow real and what we don't realize is that well we don't know what's going on in those pictures we don't we see a picture of a happy family and we think oh how wonderful and how beautiful and how perfect but we don't know what's going on in that picture we only see uh you know we only see a picture a moment a second of you know and who knows what had to happen to get to that picture or what happened as soon as the picture was done. All we know is that it was this, you know, we have this idyllic vision of what we think everything should look like, but that's, it's, it's not an action. It's a, it's like, it's this stuck in our mind. This is, this is how it has to be. And so we try and, manipulate everything around us to create that exactly it's what people do and what that stems from is one self-centered i want to be i want the world and everybody in it to be the way they should be yeah. which if and the way they should be is you know how i have judged that they should be so you know that is the perspective if you place yourself at the center of the universe you know, you see that you understand things. Other people don't seem to understand them. No. You know how things should work and what they should say and do. And other people just don't seem to be able to get it right. And, you know, it's funny when you think that, of course, that's the way it is. You know, I understand how people should be and what's wrong with them and how they need to fix themselves. And everybody feels that way. Even those people you're looking at and thinking they're so awful and they're so wrong and they just don't understand they're looking at you and and looking at you and saying oh that person just doesn't understand you know it's you know you you have this idea that you you understand and know almost everything and you know how people should be and that yes gets us into trying to manipulate people to be that way not because we're self-centered but because we're trying to help you know it's all for them we're just trying to help them be better and we know what's better so we're just trying to help the world be a better place by fixing it and making it better explaining to people how they need to change you know pressuring them where we have the ability to pressure manipulating where we can and uh, complaining where we can't do anything about it yeah so yeah that is typically the way people go through life and the cause is just self-centeredness and the self-centeredness is caused by fear and you know ego and beliefs you have these beliefs that you know what's best for other people but you don't know what's best for other people Thanks. other people have to grow in their own way in ways that mean something to them 
not in ways that mean something to you. And there isn't anything really you can do about that other than let people be who they are. Because as much as you try to push on them to be a way, they put energy into pushing back and not being that way. And you become part of the problem. Part of the reason they are the way they are is because of the way you are. You know, and you're the way you are because of the way they are. And the whole thing is just this big bunch of people, each one who judges the others and finds them wanting and would like to fix them. Because they have very little ego in their own mind and they're just trying to help save the world by fixing all these people. So they feel really positive about, you know, yeah, okay, I'm positive. Yes. And no, I don't have any ego. And, uh, but, you know, life is difficult for them. It's always difficult. And they think, well, if I could just get over this hump, that's you know, the problem I have now. If I could just get my spouse to do this or to do that or whatever, then life would be almost perfect. And either they never get over that hump because that other person just can't be shoved over that hump. They push back, they go the other way, or they do get over that hump, and then they find there's another hump right after that one that's just as intransigent. And if they get over that one, then they find there's another one right after that. And there's no end to the bumps in the road of life. There's one bump after another that you have to get over. One hill after another that you have to, you know, push this heavy, you know, rock to the top of. And there's always the next hill. And the idea that one day there'll be the last one and then life will be great after that doesn't happen that way because all those problems you see aren't really the problem. They're just symptoms of the problem. The real problem is you judging people, wanting to manipulate, seeing yourself as knowing what's right for everybody, what's best, your anger. You know, you get angry because people aren't doing things the right way. People are stupid. People are violent. People are all sorts of wrong. And it just makes you angry that there's people are even allowed to be there. So that's why there's always going to be another hill. Because the source of those hills, the source of those bumps in that life's road is you. You have to grow up. And the amazing thing is that once you get rid of that fear and you just let people be, and you just love and like people the way they are, you just accept them the way they are, then that bumpy road just smooths right out. And there aren't any more big bumps in the road, and life is good, and you are happy because you don't have a lot of things that have to be a certain way. You let them be however they are. Deal with them the best you can as they are, and you see life as a fun challenge. How can I deal with this in a positive way? And... It becomes fun. And yes, there's a lot of nasty things going on. People are still being shot in the classroom and, uh, you know, ugly things are going on everywhere. But that's the way people are. They have to outgrow that. And believe it or not, it's been worse and we're better off now, even all of that. You know, it's uh, it's still a lot better and it's going to get better yet. As time goes on, we're going to become kinder, gentler, more grown up. We're going to evolve as a species because evolution just keeps chugging along. It's not quick, but it's relentless. So we're getting there. And the more you evolve, the easier it is to evolve more. So it actually accelerates. And we see that acceleration. A lot of changes have taken place. And if you just look at the last 50 years, just look at the last 50 years, how much has changed? You know, life is totally different than it was 50 years ago. You know, I'm 78 now. And, you know, if I think about way life was and the way people saw reality and so on, back when I was, you know, a young person, maybe a teenager or whatever, the world is so totally different now than it was then. It's not even a similar space that we're in. I mean, it's changing so much. And the next 20 years is going to change even more than that, more than it did in the last 50, because it's accelerating. The change is accelerating. 
Yeah. And as that acceleration goes and we learn and we grow, hopefully it won't just be technology that's improving, <laughs> but the quality of consciousness needs to improve with it. Otherwise we'll use that technology in very negative ways. You know, so that's, that's kind of our challenge now that if we can grow to keep up with our technology. Right. So love is a very simple concept. It's just the natural way that people interact with each other once they get rid of their fear. It's, that's, that's all it is. And it, there's all kinds of love, even though we just have that one word and the Greeks had four or five or six words for it. Still, there's lots of love comes in different sizes. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to like somebody to love them. You know, well, all of us have probably <laughs> family members or people who you know, are close to us, brothers and sisters or parents or friends or whatever, that we don't really like very much, but we still love them. We still care about them. They're important to us and we hope the best for them. We have very positive feelings toward them, but we don't really like being around them very much. But that isn't a cause, it's a, it's a cause of sadness sometimes. You feel kind of sad that here are these people I love and I see them just hurting each other, or I see them just constantly you know, doing things that, that create pain for themselves. But that's the way it is, you accept that. You know, it doesn't make me unhappy. It's sad, but it's not sad like, oh, boo-hoo sad. It's just sad because they are, but it's just the way it has to be. It's like you can't, you can't get to the next stage without going through this stage. You've got to learn the lessons you have to learn here before you get to the next step. So they're just trying to learn the lessons that they need to learn to get to the next step, and they're having trouble doing it. Right. Well it takes a long time. It's not an easy thing to do. So you have to have patience and let them take all the time they need to, to get it done. However long that might be, might be many lifetimes before they can get over that particular hump, but that's all right. You know, they'll eventually get there. So that kind of leaves, you know, the whole concept is very positive. There's nothing negative about it, and it doesn't ever leave you feeling down. Love is always an up kind of feeling, a happy kind of feeling, even when people are still unpleasant. It, do it doesn't make you feel unpleasant. If anything, it makes you feel like you care. You know, you have compassion for their pain. So it's so simple, you know, there's not really much more to say about it. It's a really simple idea. Right. Right. A lot easier to do, a lot easier to talk about than it is to, to be. I agree. Because there's a lot of fear we have to get rid of. Fear that makes us, you know, self-centered, ego and beliefs. You know, we believe we're right and other people who are different than us are wrong and that we're better than other people and so on. All of that's just your fear and your ego and your beliefs all wadded up together to trying to make you feel positive and successful about yourself when in fact you don't really feel that way. And that is the root of most of people's problems is that they don't really feel that way. They feel insecure. They feel failed in some way, but it's a way that they have hidden deep down inside and that fear informs most of their choices. Most of the things they say and do, most of the choices they make are because of that fear. So when your fear is making most of your choices, your life is full of problems, full of difficulties. And it just seems like you can't ever turn it around. It's like everywhere you go, everything you do, every relationship you, you have seems to fall apart and eventually become toxic. Well, it's not because the world out there is toxic that that happens. It's because you are the one that's creating that problem. But most people won't see that. They won't see it as themselves. They'll blame it on somebody else. 
which makes it hard for them to grow up because they don't accept responsibility for their own pain and their own unhappiness. They always have somebody else they can blame it on. So when they're blame free, well, they don't have to change. They're fine just the way they are. It's that other person that needs to change. So that's why we don't change very much because we convince ourselves. We believe that we don't need to change. We're fine. Other people are the problem. So we don't change. We don't put much effort into it. It's only when we wake up to the fact that, oh, almost all of that pain and and dysfunction in my life is self-created. And when you see that, then you start (laughs) wanting, yeah, then you start wanting to change and get serious about it. Then's when you start making big changes in your life. Start doing things that that you've that not done, something to get you out of your rut. But until you see that, then you're just convinced that you're fine the way you are. Other people are all screwed up and that life is just a difficult, nasty place. And you'd like to avoid it. You know, I don't want to come back here anymore. You know, this is such a rotten place with so many rotten people in it. And that's a belief. Mm-hmm. And that belief hides you from the truth, you know, keeps you, keeps the truth hidden from you. And that's the trap that most people are trapped in, which is why evolution is so slow. We only grow up very, very slowly because we have to fight our way through this self-centered attitude of we're fine. It's all, so everything that doesn't work right, somebody else's fault. You know, so if your life is like that, then, you know, you uh, should take a, you know, you should sit down and, and take a look at, you know, of uh, really what's going on and take responsibility for the fact if you get, if something makes you angry, take responsibility for getting angry. That's your choice to be angry. Right. Take responsibility for your life. If your relationships aren't working out, don't blame it on somebody else. Take responsibility for them not working out. If you were all peace and light, probably your relationship would get better. The only reason you can't be peace and light is that other person's just awful, doesn't deserve it. (laughs) You see, that's the, that's the trap we get in. So love is a simple thing. You just, you care about people because you do. And it's not just romantic love sort of thing. It's just love. Caring is love. And it's a, it's a simple thing. And you've, you've got an endless capacity. You can love, you know, not only tens of people, but tens of thousands of people. You can care about lots of people. Love isn't something that you dish out, you know, one spoonful at a time. Love is something you just give away because you give it away because that's the way you are. It's just what you feel. And you don't expect a return for it. You're just expressing yourself. So it's a simple thing. But fear is not such a simple thing. Fear is a, is a thing that's, you know, got its tentacles deep into your psyche. And it's not so easy just to grab it and pull it up by its roots. It takes a lot of effort to change, to get rid of that fear, take responsibility. Growing up, getting rid of the of the judgmental attitude, blaming others, you know, that's a hard thing to do. But just be aware, catch yourself whenever you're negative, whenever you're thinking a negative thought, whenever you're complaining about something, complaining is negative. If you're complaining about something or someone or something, and you're upset or you're just whatever, realize that is a problem. You are part of the problem when you feel that way. You need to change that. That doesn't mean that, that you, you know, you see some horrible thing makes you happy. No, horrible things won't make you happy. It's not that, you know, that's kind of crazy. But it's just that those horrible things, you realize that's us. That's the way we are. That's the level of quality of consciousness that's in humanity right now. And until we outgrow it, it's going to stay that way. And you can manipulate things around it. You can pass laws. You can do all sorts of things that will help 
the symptoms. It may help fix symptoms, but it won't fix the problem. And those problems are going to bubble up in a different venue some other way. Okay, you, you know, I'm all in favor of making guns a lot harder to get a hold of. But if you got rid of all the guns, so that nobody in the world had a gun, nobody, no army, nothing, all the guns in the world suddenly evaporated and disappeared and weren't able to make anymore, people would still find ways to be nasty to each other, right? Well, you go back 500 years, they didn't have guns. They stuck pointy pieces of metal into each other. You know, it worked, you know, about the same way, except it was, it was up close and personal. It wasn't so much at a distance. Uh, but it, that, that low quality of consciousness is going to work out and come out and be expressed because it's there. So, Modifying symptoms, getting rid of symptoms is nice because, you know, nasty symptoms are nasty and we have to put up with it. But realize you're only getting rid of symptoms. You're not affecting the problem. Get rid of that dictator who's mean. All right. That's not solving a problem. That's solving a symptom of a problem. That dictator is a symptom of a low quality of consciousness problem in the world in general. So... We have to think of it that way, that, that yes, we can change laws, we can change our cultures, we can change all kinds of things to make the symptoms less annoying. But more annoying other things will occur, right. and it'll bubble up in other ways. It will reassert itself in just as ugly as it was before, but with just a different face, because it's there. Until you change the quality of consciousness in the population, we're going to have all this control, power, force, ugliness going on all the time. We're going to have this craziness. It's just because that's the way we are. And you can't fix all those people. They have to fix themselves. You can give them a positive environment that helps them fix themselves when I say helps them, what it does is it makes it easier, it raises the probability that they'll fix themselves. They still might not fix themselves, but there's nothing you can do about that. It just takes time. It may be decades. It may be another couple of centuries. How long will it take? I don't know, but that's evolution. It chugs along at its own speed, and it's difficult for people to change themselves. So it's slow. But people can change themselves once they understand what the problem is. People can do that real quickly. Don't have to take another millennia. So the point is that just understanding it intellectually will give you some direction of what you have to do, but then eventually you have to change it, not intellectually, but intuitively at the being level. That's where the change has to come from, or it's not going to help. Compassion. Yeah, compassion, love, caring about other people. Acceptance, not, not, yeah. I mean, it's like, it, things happen and we have to find a way to accept them for who they are or what they are or how it happened. Or, I mm -hmm. mean, I think there's a lot of people that kind of go through that spiritual bypass thing where they say, well, everything's wonderful. <laughs> I don't, I don't have any fear. I have no ego. Mm -hmm. Everything's great. I have no emotion except a smile on my face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think if you can come at it that, you know, no matter what, everybody was two years old and everybody, you know, everybody started from the same place and maybe not the same physical situation or the same, there's all sorts of things, but we can't know what they've gone through. So having compassion and being okay and accepting them for who they are is kind of, I mean, that really is the only thing you can do. Why do right. we keep trying to change people? <laughs> right? yeah. Like, why do we keep yeah. saying, I oh, don't know? No. Yeah. Probably you think that we would learn because we try to change people and it never works. Right? We can't, we can't change people, but somehow we have this belief that if we just explain it to them or just push them a little more this way or that way or make our manipulation a little more clever, we will change them. That's not the case. At best, 
what you'll change is behavior. But behavior doesn't change the person. And it's even hard changing behavior. But okay, we can change behavior. You know, we can do that with dogs and cats and horses and people. You can change behavior. But it doesn't really help that person grow up. They they act in a way that you like better. But eventually all that acting, like I say, turns sour. And now you're going to pay the price for that. All right, you got them to smile and act nice for 10 years. And now you've got 10 years worth of resentment dug deep in that person. And now you're going to have to pay the price for it because eventually it comes out. You're pushing them to be a way that they are not. And because they're trying to be, you know, happy people, they go along and go along, but it uh, is, it's, it's not real. If it comes out of the intellect and comes out of the behavior, it has to come out of your heart. It has to come out of your soul. It has to be an expression of who you are. And then it's natural. And then you're, you're grown up. So making the world a better place by getting rid of symptoms is nice, but it doesn't fix that. You know, it's something, something else is going to express that ugliness in some other way. So it's helpful in the short term, but doesn't do much good in the long term. And you can only, yeah, or the other person. (laughs) Exactly. You can grow yourself. That's what's important. Change yourself, change yourself, get rid of your fear. Get rid of your negativity. Get rid of your your complaining. Get rid of your pointing fingers and saying negative things about other people. Get rid of all of that. And if you can get rid of it, again, not just act better, you know, because you can just act through that and not do those things. And again, all the people around you will like it, but it won't make you any better a person. You need to be that way. Really change it, the way you see things, the way you interpret the data. That's the key. Yeah. That's the key thing that's necessary. So love is such a simple, natural thing. You get rid of your fear and the love is just there. That's what you are. That's what's left. Fear is the fear is the thing that turns everything bad, makes things not work. That's where the control power force comes from. You have people that need to control. They need power. They need to force things to be their way. They need to change others. All that control power force comes from fear. The fear that things aren't the way you want them to be, you know, self-centeredness, you know. So simple ideas, but most people struggle with it a whole lot, you know, and I'm, I'm one, you know, I struggled, you know, I'm 78. I've had a lot of years of struggling, made some success, you know, but still it's not a, simple path. It's not that easy just to say, oh, I see. I get it now. Okay. I'm going to change myself. Well, that doesn't work. It sounds good, but it doesn't usually work that way. Changing yourself is something that you have to really get down deep inside and and make the way you are different. And that's a, you know, it's a hard thing to do, but it's not impossible. If you really want to, you'll do it. You'll make that choice. All right. Well, this has been a great show. I liked it. I'm getting curious as to when Keith is going to organize your next event, but (laughs) sure we will hear. Uh, Uh, I think maybe sometime late this, this fall or something like that. I don't know, but yeah, it'll be in Huntsville, which unfortunately is not a, a major airport. You know, it's not a big city, you know, it's not New York or, or, Dallas, Fort Worth, or, you know, any of those places where they have big hubs that you can get to and from one big hub to the next big hub in a single, in a single flight, you're always going to have to take at least two flights, you know, to get to, to Huntsville, one from wherever you are, if you get to a big airport and sometimes three flights, if you also don't live, you know, in a major city, if you're outside a major city, then you have to take one flight that gets you to the major city, then another one that gets you to the next major city, and then another one that actually gets you to where you're going. And that can be very tedious if there's two or three hours in the airport between all of those. That's the downside. But um, 
actually Huntsville does have an international airport, oh, wow. but it, but it um, doesn't have a lot of international flights. It has some because it's got so much uh, government work here and the government people are constantly going to, you know, overseas international flights. So I guess that's why it has, it has that. And I just want to make a note that the background that uh, Tom is in is actually his backyard. Backyard? Backyard. That's my backyard. Yeah. If you sit on my back deck, that's <laughs> what you see. Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's fake. It's digital. I'm not actually sitting in front of a bunch of green trees and blue sky, but it's real. If that I was sitting on my back deck, that's what it would look like. That's a picture taken from, from my house. So I do live in the, in the woods on a, on a hill. <laughs> All right. Well, you've been listening to the news of the heart. We've been getting to the heart of what matters with Tom Campbell and well, between his celebration and love, the simplicity of trying to grow up and lower our entropy. <laughs> love it. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Laurie.